Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this summery, blustery afternoon. I'm Susan Bryson, and I'm honored and delighted to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Professor Nancy Polikoff, who is delivering uh, the annual Aaron Lecture, which this year is also the keynote address of the 2009 Dartmouth Law Day program. The Aaron Lectureship was established in 1996 in honor of Roger S. Aaron, class of 64, with gifts from the Dartmouth Lawyers Association. The alumni group that has sponsored Law Day events at Dartmouth for the last two years and has supported legal studies at Dartmouth for, I think, the past two decades. Law Day was proclaimed in 1958 by President Dwight D. Eisenhower to celebrate our nation's tradition of liberty, justice, and equality under the law. The focus of this year's Law Day program at Dartmouth is same-sex marriage in law and society. And with marriage equality bills having passed just this month uh, in Iowa and Vermont and cur currently before legislatures in Maine and New Hampshire, I cannot think of a more timely topic. In fact, this topic has generated so much interest here that Law Day has turned into Law Week, which this year coincides with Pride Week at Dartmouth. Law Week will continue tomorrow at 4.30 in 105 Dartmouth Hall with a panel of three scholars who've written and spoken widely on the subject of same-sex marriage. Professors Greg Johnson and Jackie Gardina of the Vermont Law School and Professor Brian Gilley of the University of Vermont. This panel was organized by Professor Bruce Dutu, who will also moderate the panel. Then on Thursday at 4.30, also in 105 Dartmouth, there will be a panel of jurists from three state Supreme Courts. Associate Justice Robert Cordy from the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, Associate <coughs> Justice Joette Katz of the Connecticut Supreme Court, and former Associate Justice James Morse of the Vermont Supreme Court. These justices each participated in the landmark rulings from their respective courts on same-sex marriage. Attorney Beth Robinson, co-founder of the Vermont Freedom to Marry Task Force and a visiting professor this term at Dartmouth, will be moderating that panel. Also on Thursday at 2.30, just prior to that panel, um, also in 105 Dartmouth, there'll be a panel discussion directed specifically uh, at Dartmouth undergraduates on careers in the law, and the three state Supreme Court justices and members of the Dartmouth Lawyers Association will be present for that. All of these events are free and open to the public, and it's a real pleasure to thank those who made these events possible. The Legal Studies program, especially this year's convener, Professor Bruce Dutu, who's dedicated considerable time and energy and inspiration to planning these events. The Dartmouth Lawyers Association, in particular, Hal Rabner, Ted Little, and Lanny Kurzweil, for the foresight, fundraising raising skills, and ongoing commitment that have made the Dartmouth Legal Studies program possible. The Rockefeller Center, especially Judy Fothergill, the events administrator at Rocky who has helped legal studies with events for the past five years and whom we'll miss greatly when she retires this August. The Office of Alumni Relations, especially Stephanie Chestnut and Joni Radu, who've been immensely helpful in organizing Law Week. Dee Gala, the Dartmouth Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Alumni Association. And finally, the Office of Pluralism and Leadership, in particular, Pam Meisner, the advisor to LGBT students. Today's Aaron lecturer and keynote Law Week speaker, Nancy Polikoff, is professor of law at American <coughs> University, where she's taught family law for more than 20 years. Previously, she practiced law as part of a feminist law collective and directed the family law programs at the Women's Legal Defense Fund. Since her first article on the custody rights of lesbian mothers was published more than 30 years ago, she's not only published numerous law review articles, but she's been a highly effective advocate for lesbian and gay families. She helped develop the legal theories in support of second parent adoption and visitation rights for legally unrecognized parents. She was counsel in the 1995 case that established joint adoption for unmarried couples in the District of Columbia, and in the 1998 Maryland case overturning restrictions on a gay non-custodial father's visitation rights. Professor Polikoff's book, Beyond Straight and Gay Marriage, was published last year to critical acclaim and was quickly reissued in paperback. It's actually the first book in the Beacon Press series, Queer Ideas, edited by our own Michael Bronski. Uh, there will be um, a book signing after this event in the hallway outside. It has already been nominated for several prestigious awards and was named a Winter 2008 Great Read by Ms. Magazine. Publishers Weekly has called it, quote, an evocative read that takes in the full breadth of the issues <laughs> affecting marriages and avoids pedantry while remaining persuasive. And Amber Hollybaugh of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force has written, quote, this book really matters. It is brilliant and thoughtful. 
a manifesto to transform the way we understand, recognize, and respect the reality of our diverse and complex family compositions. Professor Polikoff's lecture this afternoon is entitled Beyond Straight and Gay Marriage, Valuing All Families Under the Law. Please join me in welcoming Professor Polikoff. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Judy, for making um, it possible for me to be here today. I'm very honored to be delivering the Aaron Lecture this year. <clears throat> and I'm very anxious to um, talk in response to your questions and comments, so there's going to be plenty of time for that. And um, please, I hope you will participate as much as possible in a lecture format. Ronnie has a serious medical condition. She can't get to doctor's appointments on her own because she suffers blackouts walking down the street. When her partner of 20 years, Elaine, asked for family medical leave to take Ronnie to her appointments, Elaine's employer said no. Eugene did not come home from his job on the 102nd floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. When Larry, his partner of 14 years, filed a workers' compensation claim, the reviewing agency replied that he did not qualify for survivor's benefits, <laughs> which might instead be paid to Eugene's father, from whom Eugene had been estranged for 20 years. Janice and Lisa, partners for almost 20 years, were about to leave a Florida port on a vacation cruise with their three children, when Lisa collapsed and was rushed to the hospital. Janice was denied access to Lisa in the hospital, was denied information about her status, and did not see her for eight hours as she lay dying of a brain aneurysm. These stories are three of many deployed by gay rights advocates as potent ammunition in the battle for access to marriage. If Larry and Eugene had been married, advocates say, Larry would have received the workers' compensation survivor's benefits. If Ronnie and Elaine had been married, Elaine would have been entitled to leave. If Janice and Lisa had been married, the hospital would have allowed Janice to be with Lisa. The harm in these <laughs> narratives is caused by the denial of marriage to same-sex couples. The solution is allowing gay and lesbian couples to marry. But I see the harm in these stories differently. As a privileging of marriage above all other family forms, and so my solution is not marriage, but law reform that values the families and relationships that people value without carving out a special category for marriage. Now, I was recently in Australia on a Fulbright grant, and when I talked about these examples there, they resonated differently from the way they resonate here in the United States. And that is because in Australia, there is legal recognition of what they call de facto relationships, same sex and different sex. And that recognition has virtually extinguished the difference between how law treats married and unmarried couples, much like Canada does today. And same sex de facto couples are included within that legal regime. Um, but here, I need to talk about something that, again, is basic to the understanding of law in some other countries, but completely unknown here, this kind of recognition of unmarried couples. And so I do want to start by briefly explaining why I think the United States grants so few legal consequences to unmarried couples. I don't think you can understand the contemporary American gay rights movement and its emphasis on marriage without a little bit of this background. The early gay rights movement emerged around 1970 at a time when feminism and the sexual revolution were transforming family life 
loosening the ironclad grip of patriarchal marriage on social organization. In that context, gay rights advocates naturally joined a chorus of voices, including those championing divorced and never married mothers, communal households, extended families, and other diverse family structures. Marriage was part of the problem. It was not part of the solution. Dramatic legal changes ensued. The United States Supreme Court ruled that unmarried persons had a constitutional right to use birth control, that women with unmarried male partners could not be denied public assistance, that children born outside marriage could no longer have a second-class legal status, that all women had the right to terminate a pregnancy, that laws could not discriminate against women in marriage or in the public sphere, and that Congress could not deny food stamps to hippie communes. While none of these were gay rights cases, they all made marriage matter less, thus opening up the social and political space for all families that did not fit the traditional form. In addition, state laws permitting divorce only if one spouse was guilty and the other innocent were replaced by a no-fault no system that transformed marriage from a lifelong commitment to a relationship that either spouse could terminate for any reason. Now, during this period of time, the gay rights movement experienced many successes. For example, anti-discrimination ordinances in several cities and counties and victories in court for some lesbian mothers seeking to keep custody of their children when they came out and divorced their heterosexual spouses. The first acknowledgement of couple relationships came somewhat later in the form of domestic partnerships, which initially recognized both same-sex and unmarried different sex partners. They were an alternative to marriage rather than a, a compensation for same-sex couples because they were denied access to marriage. Those times, the times that I've now described very briefly and we'll happily talk more about in questions if you like, were followed by a dramatic right-wing backlash against abortion, against gay rights, against mothers without husbands. At first, the rhetoric of that backlash was grounded in religion, but eventually the language of social science replaced the language of religion. And out of that backlash emerged a self-described marriage movement and this movement has had increasing hold on American domestic policy. Today, this movement is a combination of religious and secular organizations and individuals who assert that the decline of lifelong heterosexual marriage is responsible for every conceivable social problem, including poverty, crime, violence, substance abuse, illiteracy, homelessness, and chronic illness. I am not exaggerating. Its bogus use of social science produces tidy sounding snippets, but a bad social and economic agenda. Marriage promotion has become a staple of public policy and $750 million a year were allocated in the latest welfare reform effort to the promotion of marriage, including the result of which has been, for example, in my city, Washington, DC, um, bus shelter posters which, with pictures of brides and grooms that say marriage works. Well, those are our tax dollars at work promoting marriage. In this context, legal recognition of unmarried couples would be seen as a form of societal suicide 
because these are the people who are blamed for causing our social problems. And the gay rights movement does not want to be associated with that. And so it has become commonplace for gay and lesbian couples and their advocates to emphasize their allegiance to the institution of marriage as the essential building block of society. This plays out in various ways, but it played out um, in a way particularly dramatic and disturbing to me in last year's litigation over same-sex <coughs> marriage in California. I have always thought that the strongest argument for same-sex marriage is that as long as different sex couples have the option to marry, then the principle of equality demands that same-sex couples have that option also. And I continue to believe that. When a state or a country grants the consequences of marriage to same-sex couples under a different name, such as domestic partnership or civil union, that is a decision to treat same-sex couples as different and implicitly inferior. It is not equality and should never be confused with equality. But if the state abolished civil marriage for everyone, or replaced the word marriage with a new term for intimate partnerships, such as civil union, civil partnership, or domestic partnership, that would also be equality. And there is precedent in family law for replacing words laden with baggage from a problematic past, such as divorce and alimony, with new terminology that symbolizes a break with that past such as dissolution and support. Marriage has a long history of exclusion. Slaves, interracial couples, and same-sex couples have been denied it. It has a long sex-stereotyped past that is both unconstitutional and inconsistent with modern values. For many people, marriage is moored to religious doctrine that belongs in churches, synagogues, and mosques. Different terminology, such as civil partnership, which is the one I prefer, distances this legal status from its past and from the components of marriage that religions define. In the California marriage litigation, gay rights groups had the opportunity to champion equality and at the same time support new terminology for the civil status granted all couples. Because California granted all the state-based consequences of marriage to same-sex couples who registered for the status it called domestic partners, the litigation in that state was for the name marriage. It was not about a denial of rights. It was about access to marriage rather than a separate status. After the case was fully briefed, the California Supreme Court asked supplemented, supplemental questions and requested additional briefing. The court specifically wanted to know if the state could eliminate the word marriage for all couples and replace it with another term. This was the opportunity for gay rights advocates to tell the court that the issue was equality and that if the state abolished marriage for everyone and called the legal status it granted all intimate unions domestic partnership, then that would be constitutional. What was unconstitutional, they could have argued, was creation of a separate status for same-sex couples alone. Instead, it was the state of California that said it could eliminate the word marriage. The gay rights groups argued that the state could not. The word marriage, they argued, was part of the constitutional right to marry. No other name for an intimate union was permissible. On this, the gay rights groups agreed with the right-wing opponents of marriage equality who were also parties in the case, strange bedfellows. The briefs read as an ode to marriage, as something of majestic status 
that provides a, these are quotations from the brief, unique quality of intimacy and emotional connection, unique public validation, unique ability to bind two people in a distinct relationship of love and mutual commitment that is central to personal identity. The brief quotes approvingly from prior cases the language that, and this is a quote, the structure of society itself largely depends upon the institution of marriage. And they also said that marriage is, again, a quote, the basic unit of society. Now, I don't use PowerPoint, but if I used PowerPoint, I would have put up there at the beginning of my talk for you to contemplate the sentence, the structure of society itself largely depends upon the institution of marriage, and asked you who you would imagine putting their name to that sentence. My guess is that most of you would have come late to the thought that gay rights groups would be the ones promoting a sentence that said the structure of society itself largely depends upon the institution of marriage. And yet the gay rights groups in the California litigation validated that sentence and made it their own. Replacing the term for marriage with another term, they argued, would infringe the fundamental right to marry for everyone. Here's another quote. The essence of marriage lies in its intangible and symbolic aspects, which derive in large part from its historical and traditional significance, as well as from its continued centrality as the basic unit of our society. By definition, neither domestic partnership nor any other newly minted status can provide the intangible benefits that come from the ancient tradition of public declaration and recognition that only marriage and that marriage and only marriage provides. I had thought that the historical and traditional significance of marriage was precisely what the gay rights movement and the feminist movement had opposed for the last four decades. To find this rhetoric in the arguments for access to marriage for same-sex couples demonstrates the strength of the cultural and political discourse in this country about the superiority of marriage. These positions play squarely into the hands of opponents of family diversity, and they denigrate the lives of many lesbians and gay men. They reinforce the propriety of giving married couples a special legal status, and they reject what I consider to be a truly transformative outcome that the gay rights movement could achieve, a new legal world word to describe the civil status of couples. This emphasis in same-sex marriage advocacy has had some unintended and yet predictable consequences. In the states where same-sex couples can marry or enter a legal status with equivalent state-based consequences, such as civil unions, it has become virtually impossible for gay rights advocates to argue for any protections for couples who don't formalize that status. In fact, you might ask yourself, is it a gay case at all if two men, as to use an example from a, a very famous case in New York, two men live together for 12 years as a family unit in an apartment that's rent controlled and in the name of one of them only, and when that one dies, the other one wants to stay in that apartment. He can only stay if under the law, he is a member of the deceased tenant's family. The landlord, of course, wanted to get rid of him to get the apartment out from under rent control. Those of you from New York will appreciate that. 
the gay rights groups argued for a functional definition of a family unit. They were joined by advocates for uh, people living in poverty, for a wide range of family units and constellations, numerous friend of the court briefs from numerous organizations saying that the traditional definition of family, lit limiting it to a spouse, a parent, a child, a sibling, was going to leave out too many of the ways in which people actually live their lives. Now imagine that couple today in a state that allows same-sex couples to marry, and they don't. Is it a gay case? Will gay rights legal groups represent that couple anymore? Or having won the option to marry, has that in fact created not a choice, but an imperative that a couple marry or face the draconian legal consequences that have been facing unmarried different sex and same sex couples in this country and that the gay rights movement has for most of its period of time been a part of arguing against. So Massachusetts, which was the first state to allow gay and lesbian couples to marry, has two relatively recent court decisions reinforcing that same-sex couples can be treated differently for determinations of parentage and eligibility to claim for loss of consortium, depending on whether they are married or not. And the, the more, to me, shocking of those cases was a case in which a couple decided to have a child together th using donor insemination, and had they been married in Massachusetts, now of course this happened at a time when they couldn't marry, but the decision came after marriage, and it makes clear that had they married, the non-biological mother would have been the legal parent of that child <laughs> and could not have walked away and refused to pay child support when that relationship broke up. But because they were not married, she was somebody who would not be treated as a parent. The court said that would be like having parenthood by contract because this was something she had agreed to do. And they were not going to support that. The court was not going to support that. So right now, the law in Massachusetts is if you are a married lesbian couple, well, then the court recognizes you both as parents. But if you are not a married lesbian couple, then the court will not recognize that second person as a parent unless you take the additional step of completing a second parent adoption. But marriage as the dividing line for who's a parent and who isn't is absolutely the wrong dividing line. 40 years ago, we decided that children should not be penalized because their parents are not married to each other. And yet there is a child in Massachusetts right now who lacks financial support from someone who was in part responsible for her conception because that couple was not married. This is the context in which I argue that marriage should not be the dividing line between relationships the law counts and those it doesn't. My argument goes beyond unmarried couples, and I'm going to make that clear in this talk. And what I basically do is suggest the following methodology. There needs to be the best possible fit between the purpose of a law and the relationships included within that law's purview. And amazingly, in doing the research for my book, I discovered isolated instances where the law works exactly as it should. And so I'm going to share with you some of the things that I have found, even if they only exist in one place, that fulfill exactly what I believe should be the thrust of the law of families. So what I'm going to do is return to the examples with which I started this talk. Again, all examples offered 
um, in this country to argue the imperative of allowing same-sex couples to marry. Ronnie and Elaine. If Elaine worked for the US federal government today, she could use her own sick leave to take Ronnie to medical appointments. It's not because the government recognizes unmarried couples, gay or straight, it does not. But because federal government employees can use their sick leave to care for, and this is a direct quote from the law, any individual related by blood or affinity whose close association with the employee is the equivalent of a family relationship, end quote. It is a standard that allows employees to define their own family members, and in this instance, it is the right approach. We permit leave from work for caregiving because it furthers the ability of employees to balance their work and family responsibilities. It minimizes the likelihood that a person will have to choose between those responsibilities facing loss of a job due to honoring the commitment to care for loved ones. If this is the law's purpose, that purpose will best be fulfilled by an expansive definition, like the one our federal government uses now for its own employees. And it is not an accidental definition. It is intentional when it was proposed by the Office of Personnel Management, it was published in the Federal Register. There were federal agencies who responded to that proposal by saying, this is much too broad a definition. We think there will be abuse and that it will be unwieldy and we won't be able to implement it. And the Office of Personnel Management in its final regulation said, thank you very much for your comments, we disagree with you. We fully intend for people to be able to use this leave to care for families in non-traditional family structures. And that has been the law for more than a decade. Now, to illustrate the importance of this principle to the gay community, I'm gonna use and as an example my friend Joan, and you're gonna hear about her again. Joan is a 63-year-old single lesbian her parents are dead. Her only sibling lives 2,500 miles away in San Francisco. She has no children. She lives alone. Joan and I have been friends for more than 30 years. For more than 25 of those years, we have been members of a Jewish lesbian group that meets every three weeks, celebrates Jewish holidays together, and has been there through each other, for each other through everything the last 25 years has brought each of us. When one member of our group needed daily psychiatric care but could not drive herself, Joan, whose job as a photographer and filmmaker gave her flexible hours, regularly drove that person to her medical appointments. But what will happen when Joan gets sick? A family leave policy should recognize that she does indeed have family although her family doesn't fall into conventional categories. This is not a uniquely gay issue, but I believe it is of special importance to us. Gay people may be more likely than others to move away from their families of origin to more supportive locations than their hometowns. Thus, they may be less likely to live around the narrowly defined group of relatives who would be allowed to care for them under many family leave laws. In addition, in spite of the gaby boom, we are less likely than heterosexuals to have children who will eventually grow up and be there when we age potentially to care for us. The AIDS crisis demonstrated the way in which gay men and lesbians can come together to care for individuals they consider members of their family. And a family leave policy must <laughs> encompass the widest possible range of family configurations in which people actually live, or it will not accomplish its purpose. It will leave out too many people, and it will leave out 
too many members of the lesbian and gay community and our families. Now, the example of Larry and Eugene differs from this first example. While allowing people to define their own family is appropriate for a law designed to balance work with family care, it is the wrong basis to allocate death benefits when an employee dies. The purpose of workers' compensation survivors' benefits is to compensate for the loss of an economic provider. Therefore, these benefits should go to those financially dependent upon the employee in whole or in part, regardless of legal relationship. In addition, when there is a set of benefits, a set amount, that must be divided among multiple dependents, I argue that the law should prioritize children over adults. Law professor Martha Feynman has written transformative legal scholarship about inevitable dependency, that which children have, and also very elderly people often, and the derivative dependency of those who take care of them. And part of what her work demonstrates is we need to be looking at prioritizing the care of inevitable dependents over, for example, adults who are capable of self-support. And I'm going to illustrate to you how wrong our law gets this now, which is another example of the overvaluing of marriage. Private first class Hannah McKinney married just before deploying to Iraq. She entrusted her two-year-old son from an earlier relationship to her parents. Hannah died in Iraq, and the military paid a $100,000 death benefit to her husband not to her parents, who will raise her son. I did some research into this benefit because I found it so peculiar. The benefit, originally a much smaller dollar figure, was created in 1908. And all that's happened since then is they've raised the dollar amount to where it is now $100,000. It originally went to the widows of servicemen. In other words, it was a sex-specific benefit. That reflected the world as it existed at the time. Wives were dependent on their husbands. Indeed, they were legally subjugated to their husbands. They were not expected to hold paid employment, and if they did, they would find their paths blocked by perfectly legal sex discrimination in employment. In addition, divorce was rare, and a man had no obligation to support his biological children unless his wife gave birth to them. So in 1908, when this benefit was created, if a serviceman had children he was obligated to support, they were likely living with his surviving spouse. So maybe Congress wasn't ignoring the needs of children when it enacted this benefit, but rather thought that by paying the spouse, the government was simultaneously providing for the children. Maybe. But as Hannah's example demonstrates, that assumption no longer holds true. Today, if we want to assure that a deceased worker's children are provided for, we need to make payments directly to the person caring for those children and not assume that payments to a current spouse or even a current unmarried partner would achieve the right result. What's more, we need to acknowledge that adults sometimes support children with whom they lack a legal parental relationship a stepchild, an unmarried partner's child, a niece, a cousin, a godchild. Any child the decedent was actually supporting should receive those survivor's benefits. Now, Eugene did not have any children. 
So it was not an issue in his case whether children were going to receive any benefits. Larry was denied benefits because New York law limited workers' compensation survivors' benefits to spouses. In the absence of a spouse or child, the benefit would go to a legal relative, even if that relative was not at all dependent on the deceased worker. That is a result that should never happen if the purpose of the benefit is compensating um, a dependent for the loss of an economic provider. Now, again, I've told you I found examples in the law that do the things I want done. And so there are actually a handful of states that have benefit schemes carefully tailored to the goal of compensating for the loss of an economic provider. And here I'm going to use the example of Harvey Milk. When I started talking about my book over a year ago, I had to explain who Harvey Milk was. But thanks to Sean Penn, I don't have to do that anymore. But if any of you missed it somehow, openly gay San Francisco supervisor Harvey Milk was assassinated on November 27, 1978 by a former supervisor who also murdered the city's mayor, George Moscone. Milk was a community leader. He was dubbed the mayor of Castro Street, and he was the first openly gay elected official in a major U.S. city. His surviving partner, Scott Smith, received workers' compensation death benefits. Scott, Smith's and Scott Smith and Harvey Milk were not married. They were not even registered domestic partners, a status that had not yet been invented in 1978 and didn't come to San Francisco until 1989. Scott was successful because California does not limit this benefit to spouses. Had the World Trade Center been a landmark in Los Angeles, Larry would have qualified for benefits. But if the purpose of the law is compensation of those dependent on the worker, then it is as appropriate to include all surviving spouses as it is, as it is to exclude all who are not spouses. Applying the methodology I advocate does more than just add categories of individuals to rights now enjoyed by couples. It also interrogates whether all couples, all married couples, should qualify for inclusion within the purview of a particular law. And here, in my research, I was also pleased to find that there are a handful of states that require even spouses to prove that they were actually dependent in whole or in part on the deceased. Just being married isn't enough. So we have a model in the workers' compensation survivors' benefits schemes in a handful of states of the rules that should be in place any time the purpose of a law is compensation for the loss of an economic provider. So workers' compensation death benefits is one example Another would be the example of the ability to sue for wrongful death. Now, right now, the ability to sue for wrongful death goes to those listed in a statute to that effect. And so you have, in most places, the conventional definition of family. And if you are living in a financially interdependent relationship with a person who dies at the hands of someone else due to either negligence or intentional killing, you cannot bring a wrongful death action unless you are married or in a traditional definition of relative, no matter what your level of economic interdependence. Yet the measure of damages that are given if somebody is successful in a wrongful death action is the economic value of the loss of that person. A wrongful death action is not a chance for the doctor who committed medical malpractice or the drunk driver 
who killed somebody with a motor vehicle to compensate survivors for their pain at losing a loved one. The measure of compensation is the economic value foregone by the, having the person die whenever they died. It's so consistent with that to have the target of that relief be those who were financially dependent. And if you go back to the writing of wrongful death statutes in the 19th century, they were understood as being designed to compensate economic dependence. It's just that at that point in time, it would have been impossible to talk about unmarried couples in that category. Right? Culturally, socially, legally, the sex performed by an unmarried couple was criminal. Their children had birth certificates that were stamped with the word bastard. So it's in that environment that you have a law created whose purpose is to compensate for economic dependency, for the loss of an economic provider, and of course, it's married couples. That's who there was then. Today, we have people living in economically interdependent units who do not marry, even though they legally could as different sex couples, who do not marry because they are same-sex couples and do not want to and should not be forced to marry if same-sex marriage becomes available in their state, and we have other forms of economically interdependent family units who suffer the same economic loss and need to be compensated fairly by our laws. Finally, I want to return to the hospital visitation policy that denied Janice access to her dying partner. In litigation seeking access to marriage for same-sex couples in the US, the plaintiff couples describe their lives and their reasons for wanting to marry. The single reason that shows up most often on their list is hospital visitation rights and medical decision-making power if one partner cannot make those her own decisions. The problems the couples describe are real the example of Janice and Lisa, which is a very recent example, just from last year, shows that. In the litigation, the couple say that the solution to their problem is marriage equality, that if they could marry, they would have the automatic right to visit and make medical decisions. The role of hospital visitation in the rhetoric surrounding same-sex marriage has become so prominent that perhaps you remember that Barack Obama in accepting the Democratic Party nomination for president last August said as follows, I know there are differences on same-sex marriage, but surely we can agree that our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters deserve to visit the person they love in the hospital. Never has there been so poor a fit between problem and solution. And to illustrate, I'm going to return to my good friend, Joan. Joan lives in the state of Maryland. Last year, the state legislature passed a law that somebody qualifying as a patient's domestic partner must be permitted to visit and make decisions if the patient is unable to do so. The definition of domestic partner in the Maryland statute requires proof not only of living together, but of economic interdependence so complete that if my partner of 20 years and I did not have documents already naming each other for a variety of purposes, including those, we would not qualify as domestic partners under the Maryland statute. Yet economic interdependence bears no relationship to who should be able to visit whom in the hospital or make their medical decisions, and neither does marriage. The purpose of any law governing hospital visitation and medical decision-making should be achieving the result 
the patient would want. I believe there is uniform agreement across the political spectrum, <laughs> not that same-sex partners should be able to visit each other in the hospital, but that every patient deserves the autonomy to decide for herself who her visitors will be, and if she cannot make medical decisions, those decisions should be made by the person the patient would pick. And so at a talk I gave in Washington, D.C., where an audience member commented that formal couple recognition worked reasonably well to meet the needs of gay men and lesbians, my friend Joan stood up and said, it works well for the people it works well for, but what about the rest of us? Joan cares as much as I do that her chosen people be allowed to visit her and make medical decisions if she cannot. The best way to achieve this is through a free and easy to use advanced directive registry. We have a few states that have these and they are not necessarily gay friendly states. The one that I trumpet the most is the one in Iowa. I'm sorry, in Idaho, I said that wrong. In Idaho, which is a gay friendly state. Here's how they work. You fill out a form. In Idaho, when you go to the doctor, the doctor actually hands you a pamphlet explaining the registry and the form to fill out. On this form, you say who it is you want to make decisions for you if you are unable to make them for yourself. You send the form to the Secretary of State's office where, with no cost, for free, it goes into an advanced directive registry. You get back a wallet card, a card the size of your driver's license that will fit in your wallet. Now, if you're hospitalized in an emergency, you know they look in your wallet. They look to see who you are so they can notify somebody in. They look to see if you have health insurance. I'm very sorry to say, but it's true. <laughs> So they look in your wallet and they find the card. The card has numbers on it and it actually has a scannable barcode on it, although I'm told the hospitals don't quite have the scannable barcode thing up and running, but they do have the number thing up and running. At the hospital, they put the numbers into the secure registry of the Secretary of State that only hospitals and medical providers have access to. And right there on their screen, they learn who it is you have designated as the person that you want to make decisions for you if you cannot make them for yourself. We know how to do this. We could make it culturally common by giving this information out to people when they register their cars, when they renew their driver's licenses, when they register to vote, as well as at medical clinics and through doctors, we could make this happen. One last point on the poor fit between marriage or couple status and medical decision making. There are two American studies published on choosing a surrogate decision maker. One surveyed all the patients at an outpatient clinic in Chicago on a particular random day, just surveyed every single person who was there, asked if they had written advance directives naming a surrogate decision maker. Few of them did, that is no surprise. Almost all of them said they would fill one out that day if the doctor asked them to do it. When asked to name the person they would select, 33% of the married patients picked somebody other than their spouse. The other study was of older Detroit patients who did have advanced directives. 50% of the married patients had picked somebody other than their spouse. If we want to guarantee every gay person the autonomy to control their hospital visitation and medical decision making, we need to look beyond marriage and even beyond recognition of unmarried couples to a regime that works for all of us. The examples I've given today are just a few. 
of the context in which we need to rethink laws that grant married couples or even couples special status. There are many others. A 59-year-old woman in a subsidized housing unit in New York City received a notice terminating her subsidy because she moved her father into her one-bedroom apartment to care for him. The city said it was overcrowded. Had she married and moved her husband in, that would have been acceptable. The elderly burden sisters in Great Britain face the prospect of a state taxation when the first of them dies that will result in the survivor losing her home. They would not face such a consequence if they were married or in a civil partnership. In the criminal investigation that led to impeachment proceedings against President Clinton, Monica Lewinsky, the White House intern with whom Clinton had a sexual liaison, had a mother who was forced to testify about the matters her daughter had confided to her or face jail time for her refusal to do so. If Monica had married, presumably after the liaison, and had confided in her husband, those communications would have been protected by the evidentiary marital privilege that says a spouse does not have to testify against another spouse. Laws that carve out a special status for marriage are a leftover from a very different time when marriage had a very different meaning. Extending identical legal consequences to unmarried couples would be a huge improvement the way they do it in Australia and in Canada. And it is one that I dearly wish would come to the United States. But it is still an incomplete family law revolution and it will often replicate injustice. I call for law reform that more closely matches the purpose of a law to the relationships included within it. That's the way we can best value all the families and relationships formed by gay and straight people alike in a modern and pluralistic society. Thank you. Questions, comments? Um, <clears throat> a good deal of what you talked about focused on kind of broadening the familial structure uh, that we look at society. Don't you think that could also allow for abusive structures like uh, polygamal, uh, polygamy in, um, in relationships like that uh, where it's really not benefiting uh, the members of the of the structure in the way that we intended to? Well, I, I think the question of um, the, the benefits or lack thereof of m multiple partner relationships is, is a whole conversation we could have with a lot of nuance. What I would say about the law is that there are already times when the law recognizes multiple relationships, we know how to do that if we want to, and I would apply the same methodology. Um, so, for example, um, <laughs> if the purpose of a law, I gave this example to the class this morning, if the purpose of a law is um, to simply confer money on the estate of a person who died as a thank you, which is what we do now for public safety officers, excuse me, who die in the line of duty, They're, they get essentially $250,000 to give to whoever they want, except they're dead, so they've said who they want to get it in some papers that they have filled out. Its purpose is not to compensate for a loss of economic dependence. Its purpose is a thank you from our collective tax dollars for dying while serving as a firefighter or a police officer. 
the firefighter or police officer can name three people to divide up that benefit. And nobody's going to ask whether they were all having sex or not, because that's not the point. Just like that person can write a will and leave three people his or her assets. So if we're sort of maximizing autonomous distribution of, of the person's own resources, then of course we already know how to recognize multiple people and should continue to. I think there are instances when resources are scarce, when it can be appropriate to limit it um, for that purpose. So for example, the form of employee benefits that I like is um, one that we have in Salt Lake City, Utah now. Again, not a gay-friendly place, but a place where if you work for the city of Salt Lake, you can name any one adult with whom you live in a financially interdependent relationship to get your partner, your employee benefits, and that person's children. So it can be a different sex unmarried partner, it can be a same sex partner, or it can be two single women who are both mothers who've decided they're gonna join forces and one of them is gonna be the primary wage earner in their household and one of them is gonna be the primary child care provider and they're not in, a, in an emotionally, um, if they're not in a sexual relationship but they're in a, an economically interdependent relationship, that worker can cover that woman and that woman's children. Um, I would be very sympathetic to an argument that you shouldn't let a worker cover unlimited numbers of adults on their employee benefits because there is some scarcity of resources in that instance. So that's how I would look at it rather than some big question of do we recognize this as a family or not, I look case by case. And just to give you an example of just how much we know how to recognize multiple sexual relationships, we call it serial monogamy rather than polygamy. But let me, t I use the example here of Newt Gingrich. I love using him as an example because he's costing us all potentially a lot of money. Um, if you are married to somebody for 10 years and then divorce, you qualify to receive a full share of that person's social security survivor's benefits when you retire and or, or that person dies. It's sort of a combination of things. So Newt Gingrich was married to his first wife for more than 10 years and had two children with her. He was married to his second wife for more than 10 years and has no children with, had no children with her. He's now been married to his third wife for, I believe it'll be 10 years in 2010. And if he divorces her after that and marries another one, it would be four. But if he were to die now, there are three women who are eligible not to split it, but for a full share, three times the amount of whatever the top Social Security benefit is. So if that's, when I wrote the book, I think it was about $2,200 a month. That's $6,600 a month our taxpayer dollars would go to the many wives of Newt Gingrich. So we know how to do it if we want to. And there's reasons why the law is written that way. I think a lot of Social Security law and the family needs to be revisited on a global way. Um, and that you know, is actually a, a very long and very worthwhile conversation because it is one of the great injustices in, in how family law is defined. But we already know how to spend a lot of money on multiple spouses if we decide um, that we have the collective political will to do it. I just think we need to actually decide when we want multiple people to get anom economic benefits and, and um, when we don't. I would say all of the people in that unit should be able to use their their um, sick leave to care for each other. And I don't have a judgment in that context about how many people are having sex with whom. All I'm looking at is this is a unit of people who take care of each other, you know, literally take care of each other. And so they should be facilitated in doing that by workplace policies that recognize their ability to do that. Um, 
Okay. On one hand, um, I think everything you're proposing is very, very practical because you're really recognizing the reality of the diversity of family structures. But on the other hand, one could also argue uh, what you're proposing is radical in the sense that you're really getting to the root of why we have all these problems because the law isn't recognizing that diversity. Um, we all, we obviously, we know what the right-wing um, marriage movement's response is to gay marriage. Um, how do you think they res would respond to the kinds of things you're proposing, um, either in an instance like what could have happened in California with the removal of the word marriage from the law, or like just a slow change law by law to starting to kind of slowly remove the privileges of marriage? Like, I mean, in, w in one sense, I almost think it's much more threatening than the symbolism of gay marriage. And you could say, oh, well, I could just imagine what kind of right-wing pundits will be like, these crazy gay activists want to change the meaning of the relationship I have with my wife by depriving it of its legal privilege? Um, that's a really good question, and, and I have a couple of ways of answering it. On the one hand, um, they'll hate these ideas. Um, and they'll, the, the main reason why I guarantee you they'll hate them is because I want to let different sex couples have access to this structure without having to get married. Some of them would say that as long as you leave those people out, it's fine to pass laws for everybody else. Um, as long as different sex couples have to marry to get any legal recognition, they will refer to giving other people access to these various kinds of ideas. Um, as, oh yeah, there's people who aren't married and so we need to take care of some of their practical needs, but they want to leave that heterosexual relationship completely unprotected because they want those people to marry. And we've seen that um, happen, and I'm like really clear about not going there. I mean, one of the things I love about the Salt Lake City law is, yeah, they didn't want to come out with a rah-rah pro-gay rights law, and that is a large part of why they didn't institute domestic partner benefits for same-sex couples, because they didn't want to do it in the name of gay rights. But they didn't leave out unmarried different sex couples. You can work for the city of Salt Lake and have a heterosexual partner who you live with and cover that person on your employee benefits. And so I'm like rah-rah for that. But when, when, the, when there are proposals that leave out different sex unmarried couples, that's a clear line for me. Um, now, having said that, the fact that the Salt Lake City ordinance did go through, um, not under the banner of gay rights, gave us this more expansive ordinance. Um, and I think sometimes there are, I mean, in that instance, there clearly were legislators in their city council who were profoundly uncomfortable with enacting something that would be just called a gay rights measure, but were not uncomfortable with, um, with something that was passed. I mean, as they explicitly said, you know, unmarried people um, have families also, have obligations also. We want to make it possible for our employees to provide the greatest care to the people they actually are caring for. Um, so I think that although um, in one lens they'll hate it, there is another slice of it where it actually works to achieve benefits in places that don't want to do it in the name of gay rights. And face it, in the states that have constitutional amendments that ban marriage for same-sex couples, more than half of which ban any legal recognition for unmarried couples, gay or straight, the things I'm proposing are, in a sense, the only agenda there can be other than repealing those constitutional amendments, which we really need to do. But in terms of short-term gain, it has to be done under a banner of protecting diverse family forms. Because if you do it for same-sex couples or for all unmarried couples, it's going to be found unconstitutional under the state constitutional amendments. That's what happened in Michigan, where public employees lost domestic partner benefits, gay and straight 
partners lost domestic partner benefits because the Michigan Supreme Court said that the constitutional amendment that the people enacted meant that you couldn't give these benefits to unmarried couples. Uh, Judy. I want to go back to the Newt Gingrich example. Okay. Are his wives, ex-wives, only avail able to get the benefit when they're married, remarried, can they get no. the benefit? They, it's, if they remarry, they can't get the benefit, right? Um, there is a, they can't remarry before they are, I always have to look this up. They can't remarry before they're either, they're 60, I think. If they remarry after 60, they can still do it. But they, so if they do remarry before they're 60, then they're just hooked on to somebody else's social security benefits and they'd have to give up the first guy. Okay, <laughs> clarifying that. Nancy, thank you very much for that um, talk. Um, back to the California litigation strategy, you may have been an advisor, played a role in consulting, and but maybe not. Um, if not, what kind of conversation would you have had with the folks spearheading that litigation? Um, what response do you think you would have had from them? And are, de are there any prospects for where either through legislatures or another litigation, this strategy that mm -hmm. you're proposing seems to be taking hold. The, the strategy of changing the name? Well, I think the thing I feel saddest about is I feel like it's the closest we got to an official government body actually making that offer. Um, I didn't talk to them about it while they were in the process. I have talked to them a excuse me, a little bit about it since. Um, and what they say is they agonized about it. Um, I haven't had, I mean, they, they know how I feel. I'm not kind of subtle about these things. And, and the people who work at the National Center for Lesbian Rights who were in charge of that litigation, um, I love and admire um, and have had very close relationships with for a long time. So um, it's actually, you know, at a personal level, somewhat painful to even try to have the conversation. Um, I don't even take very much solace over the fact that they agonized over it. Um, I do think that some of the things that have been said in the name of advocating for same-sex marriage, I do think there are places where I have had um, a, a significant impact and actually and the litigation involving the National Center for Lesbian Rights is, um, is I give them credit in this regard. There are a number of cases, this is so shocking, like I even hate to say it publicly, but basically where in the marriage litigation, there have been friend of the court briefs filed um, by child welfare related groups saying essentially there's um, a stigma to, the, the stigma of illegitimacy continues and you need to allow same-sex couples to marry so that their children won't be faced with the stigma of illegitimacy. And it, it makes me actually want to strangle the people who write those briefs because it's, it's, it's such a hateful and reactionary thing to say 40 years after we did away with the legal distinction between children born to unmarried parents and children born to married parents. So all of the arguments that we have to allow same-sex couples to marry for the sake of their children, for the sort of the, the um, make me kind of insane, and the National Center for Lesbian Rights doesn't make those arguments anymore. I mean, I, and I had, and when I talked to one of the lawyers there about it, he said, um, oh yeah, we made them take that out. We, we're, we're not going to let them argue that here. Um, so, I, you know, I, there are places where I feel like I've, um, I've had some impact in how the arguments are made. Um, I didn't in the particular one about changing the name. And I don't know any place where that is, um, where, where that's in the political cards anytime soon. And again, that's why I think of what happened in California as a missed opportunity to go on the record in favor of equality um, under a different name. Now, I, I don't know what the court would have done, but the California Supreme Court w was very interested in this subject. It came up again in the context of the Prop 8, the litigation challenging Prop 8, because 
um, it, you know, you could still have Proposition 8 on the books saying that marriage is between a man and a woman and then change the name for everybody in California. So marriage would still be between a man and a woman, but the civil status would have a different name and it could be open to anybody. And, and suggestions to that effect came up in the oral arguments on the validity of Proposition 8. And once again, the gay rights attorneys basically said, we really want to marry. We really mean it. Marriage is what we want. Nope, not talking about equality, talking about marriage. Um, and like I said, it's, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's very distressing. Um, and I do think it comes f in the context of the climate in which marriage exists today, which is the same answer to your question about, you know, politically. I mean, I, um, you know, in a state like Vermont, which has just um, allowed same-sex couples to marry, you could conceivably have gone in the other direction for equality, right? They've had civil unions in Vermont for many years now. You could have just said, that's what we're going to call the civil status for everybody here. Um, and I think that it would have, however, required putting on the record some critique of marriage as an institution. And I think that the gay rights movement and the marriage equality movement is very reluctant to offer a critique of marriage in the context of the marriage promotion agenda that comes from the right wing, even though I'm not saying that the gay rights groups share that agenda. I don't think they do at all. But that it infects the climate so that in many ways it becomes easier to argue for marriage for same-sex couples than it does to argue for changing the name of this intimate partnership to civil unions for everybody. I'm interested, I'm interested in what you just said about what we could have done in Vermont. I'm Beth Robinson and I was involved a little bit in work in Vermont. And um, because we, we certainly didn't rule out that possibility and spent a fair amount of energy uh, exploring the possibility. Mm -hmm. And what we found was that politically, including same-sex couples within the existing structure, was, a far, was perceived as a far less radical uh, uh, mm -hmm. move than uh, taking, and it was perceived as not taking away anything from anyone else. And and I, I, I think we don't necessarily, there's sort of the valuing all families piece, and I think that doesn't necessarily encompass an ideological commitment to eradicating marriage as a state institution. Mm -hmm. For me, valuing all families uh, is about expanding the menu and expanding the law to include the other cases. But uh, for so many people, gay and straight, being married is such an important thing to them that I, I believe that the vision that you're describing um, in my view, unintentionally fails to value all families because it doesn't allow families to participate in, a, uh, who want to, to participate in a cultural institution, institution that they want. So I think the more, in, more, for me, what was a bigger struggle is we then had to decide what to do with the civil union law. Mm -hmm. And we advocated very hard to keep the civil union law and an open up for heterosexual couples so that we would have a menu that mm -hmm. people could choose from. and. Um, we, the political will wasn't there, but I just wanted to sort of follow up because you mentioned Vermont, and I wanted to thank share you. with people yeah. what those discussions were. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so, um, in earlier writings that I did many years ago, totally on the record, so everybody can see them, I I advocated in favor of abolishing marriage, and it was in the process of listening to the arguments made by same-sex couples who wanted to marry, that with what I would describe as uncharacteristic humility, I decided not to argue for abolishing marriage because I, I listened to people say how much it meant to them and decided that I was, I was not willing to basically say well, that's all false consciousness on your part. You shouldn't care about this. It clearly meant a lot to people. And 
therefore I wasn't going to argue for abolishing it. And I actually don't think of changing the name of the civil status as abolishing marriage any more than changing the legal word divorce to dissolution, which many states have done, has abolished divorce. Um, I think people could enter into, um, well, first of all, they could have a religious marriage if, if that's what they wanted, clearly. I think they could enter into a civil status where the forms they signed referred to civil partnership, and they could still say they were married and experience themselves as being married. The state would have conferred upon their relationship the thing the state confers upon relationships with a different name for everybody. And I actually don't think of that as abolishing marriage. I think of it as um, making a statement about m modern, um, modern relationships and the law. And I would be totally fine with people saying they were married under straight and gay people saying they were married. So in a sense, my, my argument is quite narrow and technical. It's about the name of that civil status. And if where we wind up is in an argument about the name of the status, I don't know how you advocate for the name marriage rather than a different name in using language that's any different from what they did in California. And it's that language that I find so troubling. When you start to talk about marriage as the essential unit of civil society, um, when, when you start to, to talk about it in those kinds of terms, you're talking about it as a, a, a privileged institution in a way that I um, have, have a lot of problems with. I feel like that just perpetuates the, the sort of elevated status of it. So, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, in, in hearing those comments and a, and a couple of others, um, I, I have to rethink what I thought I was doing in the book. Like, I really think in the book that I said I didn't support abolishing marriage, that I thought we should keep marriage. I just thought we should save, change the name. And when I hear people respond, um, and, and the book was written before that California marriage, I mean, it was sort of actually at the same time, but the, before, the, before it was down on paper. Um, so it's not in the book. Um, but, you know, the idea that the argument, that, that changing the name is actually abolishing marriage is an interesting, it's not what I had in mind, and it isn't what I have in mind. Um, so if it has that effect on people, I think then we are in a cultural conversation about what that word means. Um, and you know, that's a conversation I'm willing to have with people, as long as they're having it with me in the context where it's totally understood that under no circumstances do I support a separate category for same-sex couples. That we're talking, what we're talking about is, you know, renaming what everybody does. Do we have time for one more? more. <laughs> this will be our last question. I've been sort of playing with what might have happened if um, Shannon Minter and the NCLR had sort of made the argument that, that you wanted them to make. Um, and this sort of riffs a little bit on Beth's conversation about um, civil unions and, and the support for opening it up to heterosexual couples. Um, it strikes me that, that if they had made that argument and if the California court had said, fine, you know, here's here's the name, or given, given the choice to the legislature to say, your option, right? Different name for everybody, or, or gays get in too. Had it, had it been that option, I think the legislature clearly would have picked option B, gays get in too, over option A. And if the court had not had gone strictly to 
changed the name. I think the blowback would have been sort of even worse than what we saw because I think that one of the ways that we can sort of think of what marriage is is that, that marriage is, is sort of a property value, right? Marriage's property value is based on zoning. Right? And so part of the concern is if we rezone it to let the gays in, right? Uh, that somehow our property is, is damaged and it's not as valuable anymore. But, but the notion that somehow we might completely like restructure the property itself is even scarier. And I, and I think that you're absolutely right that there's a part of it that's, that's about um, the marriage movement and, and frankly much prior to the marriage movement. Right? This notion that marriage is the cornerstone of democracy has been around for a very long time. It's not, it has, didn't show up in the 1990s. Um, but there's, this is the cultural status that you get. This is the marker of adulthood that you get more than anything in the society. It's not graduating from high school. It's not graduating from college. It's not getting your car. It's not having your first drink. Sorry, dude, it's not graduating from college. Um, they're little steps, right? But the true marker of adulthood, the true value of, of citizenship in America, to, to sort of steal from, from Gail Rubin here, is sort of the married heterosexual, right? And I think for most people, if they had to choose between married and heterosexual in that category, they'd pick married, right? They'd rather be sort of heterosexual, they'd rather be married and let marriage be open to other people than be heterosexual and unable to marry. Well, I don't agree with that, and I'm willing to participate in a conversation where we try to have that, I mean, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with your description. I, I, I very strongly disagree with the notion of marriage as the marker of adult citizenship. I find that so offensive, and I think many gay men and lesbians also find it offensive. And um, I'm willing to be part of a larger conversation about that. And um, it's a conversation that I very much think we should be having. And I, what I would say about the marriage litigation is, if you haven't read the Iowa opinion, a unanimous opinion, it's totally different from the Massachusetts opinion. It is an opinion that says we believe in equality. It totally leaves open the door to, to the notion that you could fashion equality with a name that wasn't marriage. It does not say a single thing in it that about marriage being the building block of a stable society. Nothing. There's no ode to marriage. There's an ode to equality for gay men and lesbians, and I am all for that. And so I love that opinion. I mean, and it's just very different from the language that's used in other contexts, which is more sort of what you're describing. And I would like us to be back on the um, on the equality page with those people who do have a critique of the marriage um, heard and able to participate um, in the broader heterosexual community with what it is that marriage really means in a society now where more than half the households are not people who are married to each other and where half the marriages end in divorce, which everybody knows, and where marriage, the, the legal meaning of marriage, its significance has changed so much over time. And if we appreciate those changes as transformative as they have been, I really think that what I'm talking about is a continuation of those changes. I, I realize that it is understood as this radical departure, but really I can go down the list of all, there's nothing ever that's been more radical in family law than equalizing the status of children born to unmarried people and married people, nothing. That has totally, and everybody in this room takes that for granted that there is that legal status. But we are talking about millennia where that was not true. And that is the, it is the single most unrecognized family law revolution of my 
time. And I want to be part of a conversation about why once marriage isn't the dividing line between first class children and second class children, marriage needs to stop being the dividing line for um, everything else. And we need to recognize that the way people actually live, the law needs to accommodate. And to me, that includes losing the baggage that goes with the label of marriage. But I'm willing to to take the heat for that, I would just like some of the organized gay rights groups to who, especially the people who believe it but don't want to say it, I would like them in there kind of taking the heat with me on it also. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you, The everybody. audience would like to join us for a book signing following this lecture. Oh, We'd be happy to have you do that. Thank you.